Hey everyone, welcome to Hope City Church. I'm Ezreal and I'm part of the admin team here at Hope City. If this is your first time tuning in or you'd like to find out a little bit more about who we are, you can check us out at hopecity.ca slash new. In a minute, Pastor Ryan will be leading us in a few songs. I encourage you to take some time to stop and engage from wherever you are and to take a moment to focus your heart and mind during this time of worship.
I've always loved worship through music and I find it so cool how the last song we just sang speaks to how we are all a part of God's beautiful creation, how we were created to worship and how beautifully we fit into the universe that He has created. 
We're excited to announce that baptism class will be happening on Zoom after the service. If you're interested in exploring what baptism could look like for you, our chat host will put up a link that you can click on for more information. We know that these past six months have been strange and it's been hard to not be able to do the things that we're used to, like gather together and do baptisms, but we're finally excited to be able to celebrate with those who have made the best decision that anyone can make in choosing to follow Jesus. September is coming, and although this upcoming school year will look different than ever before, we want to make sure that students don't go back to school without the supplies that they need. On August 29, we are doing a back-to-school drive through providing backpacks and school supplies for families in our city. If you want to get involved or learn more, check out hopecity.ca slash drive through We're only able to do these things through your generosity and faithful giving. We're so excited to be able to give back to the local and global community, but we would not be able to do it without you. For more information on giving, head over to hopecity.ca slash give. In just a moment, Pastor Matt, our new Kingsway campus pastor, will be continuing our summer series entitled Weeds. This past March, we announced as a church that we are launching a new campus in the north end of the city called Hope City Kingsway, and I'm honored and excited to be the campus pastor for this new location. My family and I, were all in. We're ready for what's next. Now, with the location of the campus being in the Kingsway area, and at the time we were living in Beaumont, we decided as a family we were going to move into the community closer to the Kingsway campus. This was done for many reasons, but the main reason was to be a part of people's lives that live there. Now we found a great house in the Kingsway area and in April we moved. And we love the house that we're in. It has more space, but it has a huge backyard, something we didn't have at our Beaumont house. And with having a a two-year-old boy that likes to run and play in the dirt and a 13-year-old boy that really wants a trampoline, a huge backyard was such a bonus for us. But as the weeks went on, I started to notice something. See, we have a side door that is under a carport, which gives access to the backyard. But to get to the backyard, you must walk over a 15 foot by 15 foot area of older patio stones. And when we moved in April, it looked fine, but as spring passed and now we're in the middle of summer, something has been happening. Weeds. Aren't weeds the worst? It felt like I went to bed one night and there was nothing there. And then then in the morning, it became Jurassic Park at the side of my house with all the big trees and plants growing up between the cracks of the patio stones. Now I'd pull some of them out, but they just kept coming. And eventually I felt that if I just ignored them, they would get bored and go away. But get this, that didn't happen. Some of the weeds grew so much that my wife began to call them tomato plants. I knew then that I had to do something about it, so I had to go to the store and get some weed killer and had to drench the weeds with poison. And a couple days later, they were dead, and I pulled them all out. But do you want to know something? They keep trying to come back. I've now found my new nemesis, and it's weeds. Now, we're in the middle of our summer series called Weeds, and this is not a message about gardening or how to keep weeds out of your yard. We're talking about the things that choke out spiritual growth in our lives. Know this. You were created for more than your difficulties. You were created for more than your shortcomings. And you were created for more than your failures. You were created by God for a purpose. Paul, a New Testament writer, he wrote a letter to the church of an ancient city called Ephesus. And he said this in the book of Ephesians, chapter 2 and verse 10. He said, For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. There is purpose for you. You have value. You were created for more. But when we allow things in our life to essentially take us out or control our focus, then we aren't living to the potential that God has for us. We were created by God for purpose. We are God's handiwork to do good works. The extremely sad thing about this is many people allow things to come into their life and and hold them back from their full potential, much like weeds do. You see, weeds destroy. They have thorns. Weeds choke out healthy plants that are around them. They, they spread and can take over an area very quickly. 
But it's not just the plant version of weeds that we need to be aware of and be prepared to deal with. We all face weeds at some point in our lives. Now, Jesus talked about this. And often when Jesus taught, he would speak in something called parables. This basically means a story. A parable is essentially an analogy to help people understand what was being spoken. And when Jesus would speak in parables, he used things that were a reality to many people. Essentially, he would speak their language by using imagery that made sense to them. I want to take you today uh, to a passage in the New Testament of the Bible in the book of Mark. I'm reading from chapter 4. It says this, Again, Jesus began to teach by the lake. The crowd that gathered around him was so large that he got into a boat and sat in it out on the lake while all the people were along the shore at the water's edge. He taught them many things by parables, and in his teaching he said, Listen, a farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants, so that they did not bear grain. Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up, grew, and produced a crop, some multiplying 30, some 60, some 100 times. Then Jesus said this, Whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. And when he was alone, the twelve and the others around him asked him about the parables. He told them, The secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you. But to those on the outside, everything is said in parables, so that they may be ever seen but never perceiving, and ever hearing but never understanding. Otherwise, they might turn and be forgiven. And then Jesus said to them, Don't you understand this parable? How then will you understand any parable? The farmer sows the word. Some people are like seed along the path where the word is sown. As soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown in them. Others, like seeds sown on rocky places, hear the word and at once receive it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution uh, comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. Still others, like seeds sown among thorns, hear the word, but the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desires for other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. Others, like seed sown on good soil, they hear the word, accept it, and produce a crop, some 30, some 60, some 100 times what was sown. That was a lot of words there. So what does this mean? First of all, Jesus used the image of a farmer because this was the reality for many people. This was their livelihood. They understood the story because they were familiar with the imagery, which made it easier for them to interpret the truth behind the words. Now, this parable teaches us that life will throw things our way. Life can be full of joy. Life can be full of sorrow. Life can be fruitful. And life can be unfruitful. But I want to go back to verses 18 to 20 once again. It says this, Still others, like seeds sown among thorns, hear the word. But the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the the desires for other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. Others, like seed sown on good soil, hear the word, accept it, and produce a crop, some 30, some 60, some 100 times what was sown. You see, our spiritual growth will be affected when we allow things in our life to come and distract us, to worry us, make us afraid, and cause harm to our mental and spiritual health. But here's the thing. That is not what God intended for us. See, he is for us. He is not against us. His purpose for us is not to harm us, but to give us a hope in a future. Now, if you are living a reality right now that is full of sorrow, hurt, or brokenness, please know that God is there. You are not alone. God can handle it. He wants to help you rise out of your difficulties and walk in the purpose that you were designed for. Now, Paul, who I referred to earlier, also wrote the following to the church in Rome. It's found in the book of Romans in the New Testament. It says, No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. 
Nothing can separate us from God. His love is for us and, and, and the purpose that he has for you and me. Those things will always remain firm in place, waiting for us to receive them. Now, in the past three weeks, we've talked about finances, we've talked about loss, and last week we talked about loneliness. All three of these can be extremely dangerous if we don't navigate them properly. They will cause damage, if not destroy, our spiritual growth. And today, we're talking about image. Now, like many of you, I've had many big events happen in my life. My wedding day was a huge event. Both of my boys being born. Um, My dad passing away, although not a happy moment, still a big event that happened. And even moving across Canada from Toronto to Edmonton to work here at Hope City, all big events in my life. But to be honest with you, there's really only one big event that I would say caused me the most stress, the most anxiety, the most worry, and, and, and the most fear, more than anything else. Believe it or not, that was the first day of high school. Now, side note, high school in Ontario starts in grade nine. And in the first day of high school was extremely terrifying for me. And it's not for the reasons you might think. I wasn't afraid of getting bullied. I wasn't scared of the classes or the workload. What scared me was the impression I would make on the first day of school. You see, the image I would present of myself in my own head would determine my social status for the rest of my high school years. I needed to make a serious and massive impression on everyone on that first day. So believe it or not, I spent the entire month of August going to the mall multiple times a week to plan out my outfit for the first day of high school. The funny thing was I wasn't concerned about the second day of high school or even the following week. All that mattered to me was what I looked like on that first day. Planning was super stressful because I also didn't have a lot of money to work with. So I had to save all summer long. I had to do extra chores, jobs around the house, just to get enough money to buy that perfect ensemble. And today, I want to describe to you the outfit that took a summer to save up for, a month to plan, and in my head was the greatest first day of school outfit that anyone had ever worn in the history of the world. So on the first day of high school at Eastdale Collegiate in September of 1990, here's what I wore. On my feet were a pair of brand new black with white Reebok pump basketball shoes. Does anyone remember Reebok pumps? You literally press the little basketball on the tongue of the shoe and it inflated with air. It was amazing. I then matched those shoes with a pair of black Levi's jeans with the red tab on the back pocket. Red tab, very important. I wouldn't settle for anything less. I then wore a light purple t-shirt, something I would never, ever wear now, but for some reason I did on that day. And finally, the piece of clothing that would finish off this perfect outfit. I wore a long-sleeved white denim, yes, I said white denim, Levi's button-up shirt that I buttoned up about halfway so you could see the purple t-shirt underneath. I was kind of going for a Don Johnson from Miami Vice look. Uh, For anyone here under the age of 25, uh, Miami Vice was a very popular TV show in the mid to late 80s. Don Johnson was the star and he kind of dressed like that. Just wanted to clear that up. But after a month of planning, This was the outfit that I was guaranteed to give me an overwhelming impression with everyone at school. And do you want to know what happened on the first day of high school when I wore that amazing outfit? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. No one cared. And looking back now, that was a terrible outfit that I pieced together. But I did it because my image had become my focus. I was convinced that the way I looked on the outside would be what mattered. To me, it didn't matter who I was on the inside. The image that I presented was the only thing that would mean something. It was the only thing that would take me places. It would bring me attention. It would bring me popularity. It would help me gain a solid reputation. Maybe that's you today. Often we feel pressured to define ourselves through our jobs, our financial status, our successes, grades, appearance, what other people say about us, and and the things we own. Life is not a competition of who can have more or look better. But what happens to our image when we experience failure, or we lose someone's favor, or we become burned out in our job, or lose the job that once we thought defined us? 
Living a life trying to impress or please people doesn't bring any value to your spiritual growth. A person's outward appearance does not help them grow in their relationship with Jesus. Now I'm going to quote my man Paul once again. And here's what he wrote in his letter to the people of Galatia, which was an ancient area found in the New Testament. He said this, Am I now trying to win the approval of human beings or of God? Or am I trying to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. God did not create us so that we would live a life trying to impress one another. Paul said it very clearly. If he was still trying to please people, he wouldn't be a servant of Christ. He wouldn't be a Christian. Why? Because it is impossible to do both. See, God is the only one who deserves our attention. And when he has our attention, he begins to teach us, speak to us, and develop us from the inside out so we can go and tell people about the good news of Jesus. And that good news is is, is that he died so we could live, that his death on a cross brings us deliverance from our sin. God cares more about your character than your car choice. God cares more about your heart than the home you have. And God cares more about your purpose than your popularity. Our value to God does not lie within how we look, what we own, or who we try to be on the outside. Now, one of my favorite people in the Bible is a guy named David. Maybe you've heard or read the story of David and Goliath where, the, where a young boy killed a giant using only a sling and a few stones. Now, that same David eventually became the king of Israel. And King David wrote a majority of a book in the Old Testament of the Bible called Psalms. These are songs that were written and were full of emotion towards the reality that David and the other authors were facing. In Psalm 139, King David said this, I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it well. He praises God by saying, wonderful are your works, meaning you are wonderful. God made something wonderful when he created you. You see, image brings attention to ourselves. The focus of our efforts is to bring all attention, envy, and appreciation back to us. Now, what I'm not saying, please hear me, is that people shouldn't have nice things. I'm not saying that if you drive an expensive car or put effort into looking sharp or pretty or or even having a nice home to live in is wrong. What I am saying is that when the obsession of what you look like or how others will perceive you becomes the focus of your life, then something's off. Something has become misaligned. I think a big issue with image is that people don't know or understand where their identity is. Many years ago as a youth pastor, I asked my students to write down in one or two words who they thought they were, if they could sum it up. I then asked for volunteers to share what they wrote, and pretty much everyone did. And I heard answers such as, I'm a basketball player, I'm a dancer, I'm a student, I'm a gamer, and many more. I then encouraged them by saying this. I said, what you wrote is not who you are. It's what you do, maybe what you're good at, but it's not who you are. Your identity does not fall on the things you do with your time. Your identity comes from who you were created by. What would it look like to base our image on the way God sees us? In the Old Testament, there is a recorded story of a man named Samuel, who was a prophet, which is basically someone who would deliver messages from God. He also began acting as a judge, which essentially uh, was not a king, but someone in high leadership who would make decisions for a nation and help keep the peace. Now, the nation of Israel wanted a king to rule them. So Samuel anointed a man named Saul as king, who ended up being great, but eventually due due to his disobedience to God, he proved that he was unworthy to be Israel's king. So God told Samuel to go to Bethlehem and find a man named Jesse that had many sons. One of Jesse's sons was to be the next king of Israel. Talk about a proud dad moment. So Samuel did what the Lord said, and he gathered Jesse and his sons all of them but one. Remember that David guy I talked about? But when Samuel saw Jesse's oldest son, whose name was Eliab, he thought for sure that this was the young man who God would want to be king, just based on his outward appearance. But here's what happened. This is found in 1 Samuel chapter 16. It's a book in the Old Testament of the Bible. It says, But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. 
See, God doesn't look at us the same way others do. He's not concerned with our outward appearance. When he sees us, he sees someone that is fearfully and wonderfully made. Our outward image doesn't determine how God sees us, and I am so thankful for that. Begin to define yourself as someone loved by God. That is your true image. Anything else is simply an illusion. See, image is a weed. It can destroy. It can take over and prevent you from growing in your relationship with Jesus. You were created for purpose. Your image is not in what you have or what you do. It's found in who you were created by. It's found in how God sees you. So how does God see you? Here are three things for you to know today. Number one, you are fearfully and wonderfully made by God. Number two, you are seen for who you truly are and not your appearance. And number three, you were created by God for a purpose and not for selfish desires. Our image is found in knowing God and making him known to others. You are loved and you were created by God for a purpose, not to please others, but to make him known to those who don't know him yet. What we produce on the outside does not define the image of who we truly are. So let's make our lives focused on what matters, and that is living a life for Jesus that can be seen by others, and let's spend our efforts helping people discover him for themselves. That's the image I want to have. Now you might be watching this and realizing that what's missing from your life is Jesus. Now here at Hope City, we believe that following Jesus is the best decision anyone can make. And maybe you've heard this today and you realize that image is something that has taken over your heart and the only way to destroy that weed is to let Jesus in. If that's you, I want to say a prayer that you can repeat in your heart, a prayer that gives you a new life in Christ. Let's pray together. God, I realize that I need you today. I ask, Lord, that you would come in and forgive me of my sins. And God, would you help me in the areas that I need help, the area of image, that worry and stress of always trying to please other people. God, would you help me just to have a hunger for you and just to live a life really just trying to please you and live for you. Would you give me everything I need to do that? I surrender my life to you. Amen. Now, if you prayed that prayer today, can I tell you how incredible of a decision you just made? What you just did is so awesome. Now, can I encourage you, uh, please go to hopecity.ca forward slash life. Here you'll be able to download a digital booklet called Next Steps that talks about what it means to truly follow Jesus with your life. There's also an option for you to connect with one of our pastors on staff to just talk about the decision you made if, if you choose to do that. And lastly, we have an incredible introduction to Christianity class called Alpha, and it's going to give you the chance to learn more about it. I want to end by praying one more time. God, we just thank you. Thank you that you are for us. Thank you that that you are uh, not against us, that your love is there, that you created us for a purpose. I pray that that people listening to this today, God, would, would, would sense you speaking to them and just showing them, God, just maybe their focus was just a little misaligned and it just needs to be put back onto you. And God, would you help us in our life with the things that we need? We know that you can handle it. I thank you for this church, and I pray, Holy Spirit, would you continue to do a new work in people's lives. We love you so much, Jesus. Amen. Hope City Church, please know that you are loved and prayed for. And remember that your image is not found in others or in things. It's in the one who created you, who loves you unconditionally, and who has a purpose for your life. We can't wait to see you next week. What a great message. As we walk into this week, let's be reminded to define ourselves as someone loved by God. This conversation and process of image and identity is one that takes time to process through. It is something we are working through regularly. We encourage you to take some time to go over the discussion questions on the screen after the service. Talk about it and see how you can put what you've heard today into action this week. Don't forget, there is a baptism class happening right after the service and the chat host will be posting a link to that. If baptism is something you're interested in, we hope to see you there. Thanks for tuning in today. We hope you have a great Sunday and we'll see you next week.